Hey, everybody. How are we doing this evening? Um, so you had to do a wardrobe change already. I don't know if anybody was watching the little bit we just did with Anthony, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Anthony, uh, he, he had his little contest where he shot two uh, long boxes of comics, one Marvel DC. I won't give it away if you didn't watch it, but uh, he has yet to be able to award his contest winner because he had far too many uh, guesses come in. So I guess tomorrow morning he's going to be making that announcement. But uh, it was a fun show. We got to reshow the, uh, the Rob Liefeld piece getting shot, which was good, which was the whole reason why I got involved with Anthony on that as a project. He, he had a piece of art for sale in his, uh, his, dealer, on his dealer site that was on CAF. I was browsing his art for sale on CAF and saw that he had the Liefeld for sale for $20. And I, I thought that was ridiculous because it just said Rob Liefeld Wolverine $20. And of course, I read the description and it said it was a fake. And uh, confirmed fake, thanks to uh, Glenn from Panel Page. And um, so it was basically spend 20 bucks on this piece of art and name how you want to destroy it. So so I opted for the firing range and that kind of like dovetailed into Anthony shooting the long boxes and whatnot. So lots of fun. You know, we're, we're always just trying to keep things interesting around here. And, and I really did want to kind of talk a little bit about the whole idea that there are far too many forgeries in the hobby today and it's only going to get worse and uh and i just wanted to have a fun unique way of destroying at least one in my lifetime so anthony's going to mail me that piece of art uh sometime soon i hope so i can put it on the wall and uh cherish it for a long time so after that i i hope everybody got to see the episode last night with um with mike and anthony on the dueling dealers as well that was by far the most fun we've had and uh, we're still learning the ropes on trying to get all the production things figured out but uh we're, we're, we're getting better next week's show is going to be much more spectacular and i can guarantee there'll be plenty more uh video memes and whatnot uh yes uh, anthony said he is going to send it so hopefully he'll send it with a with one of the comics too so we'll see and and eddie thank you for uh tuning in on the uh, earlier show as well so Hopefully it wasn't too too uh, too slow pace, but uh, it, you know, Anthony's just trying to have fun, just like uh, like I am when we're putting together these videos. And he uh, that Andrew gentleman was uh, his is actually a full time hired videographer that Anthony has on staff. That's how he's putting together his daily videos and whatnot. So you know, he's embracing it like like I've been. So uh, yes, that is very true. And uh, T Gleason, yes, like Ali <laughs> versus like uh, yeah, I I, I love it. That's uh, very true. Yeah, you uh, missed the contract. Uh, yes, Jason, you did. I'm sorry. That was, uh, you would have taken that one. I was actually going to offer him the exact same price of $1,200 for that piece. And then somebody else stepped in and offered it and he took it. And unfortunately, because Maureen had added up the totals wrong, that pushed him into the lead and we thought it was all over. But as it turned out, uh, Berkey had another $500. So he ended up actually winning that round. So good evening, Larry. And uh, was it worth? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know about that, Eddie. As far was it worth it or not? Um, but what are you gonna do? Um, so anyway, that that was that. And uh, you know, we had we we've had a really uh, good time with the dueling dealer thing. So I hope everybody is enjoying those as much as I've been doing them. But I want to kind of get on with our show this evening because I've got Matt Kennedy in the green room, and I want to get some time to speak with him about his career in the hobby as an entrepreneur and art collector. So I want to run through our normal calf uh, update here. Hey, Will, how's it going? Nice to see you this evening. So, uh, you know, basically the last week, and of course this period goes for the uh, dates of the 8th through the 14th of February, sales have just been pretty crazy. Obviously the dealers have been putting more art on their sites than they ever have. And they've been having really large sales, not just like the week before Felix wasn't even involved in it, I believe. And it was over $400,000. And this week it's almost $500,000 in sales as well by the dealers. And it's just a mix of everybody between Felix and Ramita man and whatnot. And when we get to the auction houses, uh, data, basically for some reason, heritage has been putting in a lot more higher ticket items in their weekly auctions. And they've been doing a lot of PR, kind of around that. I don't know if anybody's noticed that we've been running a special press release for them the last three weeks, where it seems like every week their their uh, Sunday Monday auction is setting a new record, where I think that the, the total sales from their Sunday Monday auction this past week eclipsed or was was somewhere around $700,000. But whatever it was, it's, it's constantly going up. 
And uh, the, the art selection I've noticed in the last three or four of their auctions has also been going up. So I don't know if it's just a strategy to uh, you know get, get some more PR and eyeballs on the weekly auction, but it's it's definitely working. I mean, there was a, well, I'm not even gonna show, I'll, I'll just hold that piece later and uh, talk about that. But uh, let me jump into the dealer results for you. So like I mentioned, $489,000 in sales for dealers this past week on the dealers that we track. And that is compared to $495,000 the week before. Felix was the uh, top seller with $154,000 in sales, followed by Ramita Man with $152,000. So, I mean, they're right up against one another. And Felix had two really rather large sales, which helped him out. But then Ramita Man also had a, a ver even bigger sale. So, uh, Panel Page was next with over $80,000, Albert over 60, uh, and then Anthony around 15, and Scott Eater kind of got into the fray. He had, I think, just over $12,000 in sales. So, so everybody. Uh, that is a usual, you know, regular guy out there is was definitely selling a lot. So let me go through the top six dealer sold items during that period. So first up is the piece I was speaking about, sold by Ramita Man. The asking price was ninety thousand dollars. Steve Ditko, of course, from Amazing Spider-Man number thirty, page twenty, from nineteen sixty-five. And uh, this next piece is actually the complete issue to Bla uh, Batman Black and White, and it's a uh, Tradmore, of course, sold by Felix Comic Art for $50,000. And I don't need to say asking price because I'm quite confident that was the price. And next up is the cover to Silver Surfer Black, issue five, sold for $40,000. Once again, that is a firm price, not an asking price when it's Felix's sales. Uh, next up is this, this was sold by Albert Moy, Detective Comics 1027 cover. Jim Lee Scott Williams sold for $30,000. I'm sure that was the price as well. No discounts, maybe free shipping. And uh, this, of course, is Mike Zek, Master of Kung Fu 100, sold for $22,000 by Glenn from Panel Page Art. And finally, another sale by Panel Page Art. This is the cover to Miss Marvel 21 by Dave Cockrum, sold for $17,000. So if you went through and looked at uh, the overall report, or if you have access to market data, you would just see that la this that, that period had many sales over $10,000 as the asking price for the artwork, which resulted in the 495. There wasn't any large influx of dealers reporting commission sales or whatnot. It was just a overwhelming number of sales. So it was just a very, very busy week for, for uh, comic art dealers that I work with, because remember all the, the data that I get only comes from the dealers whom I host. So I don't track sales for any of the sites that I crawl because I can't confirm a sale for when we're uh, when I might have to remove a piece from a crawl because you know who knows why they took it down. The only time we report on sales are when the dealer is using the admins that we've built for them and they are literally taking the piece that they've had listed as for sale and marking it as sold and that data is leaving the Comic Card fans shared database. So that's where we get our all of our uh, sold data from. So clearly that's, you know, you think about it, this is just a small segment of the dealers that are out there because we only represent, uh, you know, site wise, I mean, not even 25%, right? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that they're, you know, we have, we do have some of the biggest dealers out there, but uh, this is still just a fraction of the weekly sales that are going, going on in the comic art dealer arena. So, so next up are the auction houses and I've got three pieces from both uh, eBay and uh, three from Heritage. So this uh, first piece from, well, let me just give you the numbers. This last week for them was $267,000, uh, which was up from $232,000 la uh, last week. So you can see it combined, you know, we're well over $800,000 in sales between uh, both both places. So just a phenomenal week when you don't have a signature auction, or auction going on or anything special like that. So let me go through uh, the, the uh, so eBay sales in general were really strong, higher than usual. They were almost at, uh, uh, well, they were, well, let me just jump into it. Sorry, I'm just going to pull up the video here because this first piece was actually a buy it now, by the way. Uh, it is the cover to Captain America 120 by Gene Colan and Joe Sinat, and it sold for $25,000. And I, and I looked, and, and strangely enough, this is one of the lower price sales in all of the market data that I have for a cover. So I think that might have been a bit of a steal as things go. This next piece, is, of course, is J. Scott Campbell and David Nakayama. It was a piece done for the Hero Initiative, and it sold for just over nineteen thousand dollars. 
And finally, from eBay is the Superman 210 page by Jim Lee and Scott Williams, sold for $7,750.40. So a uh, strong set of sales there from them. Now, Heritage, this piece is actually a Ghostbusters concept illustration, sold for over $14,000. We're actually three or four pieces in that lot, uh, which probably made it go for that high. And then the second highest sale from Heritage as well was this other concept set of pieces. I'm only showing this one and it sold for $8,400. Both were by Tom Enriquez. And uh, this final piece, a bit of a surprise. It's a John Buscema Joe Sinat FF 115 page as page 23 sold for $7,800. And I only say a surprise because, you know, pages like that, I mean, I wouldn't say they were half that a year and a half ago, but uh, that's a really healthy price for, for, a, for that page. And uh, it's only going to, you know, it's just going to make getting those pages even harder. You know, I think as collectors today, we're all looking at the market because I, I know I am. And I'm saying to myself, if I don't buy something soon, I'm not going to be able to afford any of the things that I want. It's it's a little bit discouraging. And I, you know, I imagine a lot of people are sort of uh, feeling the same way uh, that uh, any of the, you know, like I look at it now and I'm never going to own a Burn X-Men page. I couldn't even own a Burn X-Men page with no X-Men on it. <laughs> you know, it's just that, that I'm at that stage of the game, like a lot of people are. Um, and if I ever want to own a Cockrum X-Men page, it better be from his second run. And it probably won't have all, you know, it won't have Wolverine on it because I won't be able to afford that either. But you look at things like that, that, you know, the, as a Busema uh, Sinat FF page, you know, again, uh, you know, those pages were $500 12 years ago. So you're looking at these prices now. And, and again, I, I really feel that as uh, collectors, we, you know, we're, we're looking at this and we're seeing and starting to feel the pressure of needing to get these things now. And that is what is driving up, up the prices because other guys are just going to hold on to them. If, if my page that I bought, you know, four years ago was twenty five hundred dollars, and it's seventy five hundred dollars today, I'm going to hold on to it for another two or three years, and it's going to be worth twelve thousand dollars. So, and so, why would you sell it now? It just it's just making everything more difficult. And I think the more buyers that you know, it's good to have more buyers in the hobby. I mean, that's Calf's mission has always been to bring new collectors to the hobby, you know, and, and as its main goal, and also just kind of bring everybody together to have a good time together. But uh, the, the downside to that and the growth of the hobby has just really put a lot of us at odds with being able to afford the pieces that they want. And uh, yeah, Chris says, uh, you know, you agree it's, it's a bit fear-based. It really is. I mean, uh, cause I am, I, I'm, I'm as scared as, as everyone else. I mean, like everybody knows I'm really just getting back into collecting after really being at a point where I wasn't able to collect as much. And I'm looking at it now and I'm, I'm feeling like I got to buy up as much as I can in the next year before I can't afford it or I can't play the game like, like I'd want or, or be like other collectors that I know uh, that very, very much so are always looking for the next new person who they think, you know, will, you know, that they can buy it, buy low now because that's just wh where they're at. And, um, and hope, you know, either that you won't be able to afford them for in a few years, but you know, that's the, that's the challenge and the struggle I think that we all have in the hobby today is, is that it's, it, it's starting to feel like the art's a little bit of a commodity and, and, you know, and I don't want to feel that way. I just want to, I just love the art. That's why when we're, when the conversation on Facebook recently about the, the NFTs and uh, digital art sales, it just doesn't interest me at all because it's, it seems like it's taking collecting and, and making the hobby all about a commodity. And it's, it's just treating the art differently than, than I would ever want it. I, you know, I'm, I'm quite certain a hundred years from now, that's probably, you know, what more than 50% of the hobby is going to be like, right? Those collectors, that's what they're going to be used to. Everything that they own is digital, whether it's their music or their art. Uh, but for people like us who've been in it for a little while, I, I can never, ever, ever adopt that as a uh, as a collecting strategy or anything that I would be ever, ever interested in. But I am going to have uh, Felix Liu and Jason Schachter on Tuesday evening at 9 because as dealers, they are both getting into selling digital art for the people that they rep. And I felt like it would be a good opportunity for them to talk a bit about how they're kind of wading into this whole thing. And, uh, but you know, I, for me, it, you know, it'd be like going to a convention and seeing Katie Cook at a table and uh, instead of having all those little cards that she's got, she's just got a bunch of USB drives on her table. I mean, it's just not the same. And I don't, I don't see, you know, I don't see people who've been doing this for so long, you know, really gravitating to it, but I do see younger people or people who are interested in investment doing that. So I don't want to uh, belabor that anymore. 
And sorry, Matt, I know you're in the in the green room, and I, I didn't mean to, to go off on a tangent like that, but it's been on my mind. And if any of the Cran boys are out there, I did wear your shirt today. I wanted you to know that the Snake Plissken version I, that was my favorite. So uh, if you don't, if you're not watching live, I hope you see this later because that one's for you. I'll definitely wear the other shirt as well, probably uh, in a, in another episode, maybe on Tuesday night. So uh, let me go through the personal pieces that I picked, and uh, and and yes, Knights of Old uh, selling digital art. That's ridiculous. You know, the thing is, and I will I will just add one other thing because many people don't know that I, I actually do publish an art annual. Um, we're, uh, we've got eight that are, are already printed and I'm working on the, the ninth right now. It's it's in the science fiction fantasy kind of realm. Uh, it's called Infected by Art. And it, and it is a competition based, th- uh, you know, submission process and it's juried. And I can tell you that half of the art in the painted category, uh, it, you know, it gets split in two. We have traditional painting and digital painting because a lot of the work that's being published for uh, for print, whether it's you know, Magic the Gathering or for trade back, you know, paperback covers, those sorts of things, half of that work is digital now. And so, you know, I, you know, I, as a collector, I always look at it and think, well, these digital guys are just, they're not enjoying the aftermarket. And so I think that this is one way that they're probably going to be looking at monetizing the work that they do. I mean, I still don't get it. I still would rather have a print that they, they signed by hand and maybe remarked something on it. Uh, but that's just me, you know, some other, somebody else, Hey, I want to buy that one, you know, the actual thing that that, that guy drew on his uh, tablet. Uh, but again, not, not for me. I'd rather take that image and make it my wallpaper and not pay a dime for it. So that's, there you have it. So let me get on to the, uh, the popular artwork of mine for the week. And I, it was actually, I'll tell you, we, uh, I could have probably picked around 30 pieces because la- the art that went up during that week was absolutely spectacular, uh, just like the week prior to that. But uh, these are my favorites. So first up is this Batman by Mike Zeck. It's in the collection of Daryl R. And uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I would, you know, I would kill to own this piece. Very, very impressive. I'm sure Daryl's very happy with that one. Uh, next up, this piece is in the collection of Andy Robbins. It's Jack Kirby and John Verputin. It's from Eternals number two. It's a DPS. It's the second and third page in the book. And next up, this is from a What If the Hulk Went Berserk. It's actually from the volume one, uh, issue 45. This is in the collection of Dave W. It's Ron Wilson and Ian Aiken. And this is uh, obviously a classic cover, Gil Kane. This is Daredevil 80 from 1972. This is in the collection of Brett C. He's fighting the owl. I never, you know, the owl was never much of a villain, but he, he made a good presence, I think. And uh, and Ruben, this is Ruben, the, the duck collector. This is a cover to Superboy 31, Tom Grummet and Carl Kessel. Ruben will arm wrestle anyone for a Tom Grummet, as you all well know. Next up, this piece is in the collection of Matt E. It's Tim Sale, of course. This is uh, Batman Ghost double page spread. Uh, splash, not a spread, sorry. It's uh, pages 34 and 35. Next up is a piece from the collection of Simon K. It's Gary Frank and Brad Anderson. This is the cover to Action Comics 1027. And something you don't see too often, a George Perez Uncanny X-Men annual three page uh, inked by Terry Austin. This is in the collection of Tony Sandra Sala. And my good friend, James S. This is Ivan Rice and Eau Claire Albert. I actually had to check to make sure it was right. Eau Claire Albert. I thought it was Albert Eau Claire when I've seen it before. This is from Green Lantern 16, DPS pages two and three from 2007. Uh, this is in the collection of AMR1. It's Mark Brooks, of course. It's uh, from Demon Days X-Men. Beautiful cover. Last two pieces. This is, of course, Gene Colon and Sid Shores. It's from Daredevil 58. This is in the collection of Mark Levy. And Mark has a fabulous collection. If you're ever on CAF, be sure to look him up. And finally, collection of Dino Mauricio. This is the cover to What If, number 43, from 1992. Artists are Scott Clark and Stephen Montano. So there you go. Those are my picks. Like I said, I probably could have picked at least another 15. Um, yeah, it was a solid, solid week for our uh, collectors. And uh, keep sharing that art. We've, we've actually been 
peaking with the amount of art uh, in the last, you know, probably with all the dealers selling in the auction houses selling as well. CAF has seen a rather large spike the last two, two and a half weeks with art being posted. So it's probably why it's making, it's taking me longer to go through the stuff to see which pieces I want to feature. So I appreciate everybody posting all that. So, uh, hey, without further ado, I want to bring on my guest this evening, Matt Kennedy. Hey, Matt, Hello. how you doing? I'm well, thanks. How are you, Bill? Fantastic. Thank you for uh, waiting 20 minutes. I told you 10 minutes when we were in the green room <laughs> earlier. So, I'm sorry. Sometimes That's I fine. get off on a tangent. I was wrapped with the information that you were, you were, you were giving out and, and loving to look at other people's stuff. Well, I mean, that's what this is all about. And, you know, this particular show, I, I just wanted it to be fun and, you know, different from the, the show we do with the dealers uh, on Tuesdays. You know, it's still an interview show, but for me, it's more sharing artwork and, and sharing a little bit about the hobby and getting to know other collectors. And, and yeah, I mean, it's been, a, I think, what did I say? I'm on, this is uh, episode 32. I don't even think I said that to start this. So I've been doing this for a while, I, a, a weekly show, and I, I love every minute of it. It's, I hope uh, that makes far. me Moon Knight. This is my first appearance <laughs> in episode thirty-two. That's right. There you go. I got to start thinking like that. See, you're Matt. I might hire you for for your creativity. But, uh, <laughs> your money's no good uh, here. I'll do it for free. <laughs> all right, all right. But uh, you know, Matt, you've yeah, uh, you know, we've we've been emailing a lot, and you've you've always given me a lot of you know. I I feel a lot of good advice, even when I don't want to take it. You're you know, you're like, hey, you know, remember you should you should hashtag your things and. You know, I, I, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm, I am a, I'm like a dinosaur, even though I'm the guy that built CAF and, you know, we do all this programming and stuff. I, I'm still kind of slow on the uptake as far as, uh, you know, doing things out on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. I mean, we're there, but, you know, I, there's only so many hours in the day to try to finesse those things that I know are important. This is true. This is true. I mean, we're all sleeve facts in a, in a certain respect. Uh, to our old habits anyways. So, I mean, I, I get dragged kicking and screaming into different things too. You, know, you talk, you were talking about digital art and that's something we've been toying with for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been able to properly wrap my head around it. There was a show that we were gonna do a couple of years ago um, that was gonna be a specific digital currency only, um, a, but there was still gonna be a physical aspect to it. So we were gonna do these kind of, um, you would own these memes but the memes would be available also on a lenticular card. And then the blockchain would be a scratch off on the back of the lenticular because I like, <laughs> you want to have something physical in my hand. And so this would give somebody both ends of that. They would have the digital ownership via the blockchain address and they would have mm -hmm. something physical that they could have. But it's, it took me two years to kind of wrap my head around. I'm glad to see that Felix is doing it. I've known Felix for years. I mean, I, I was, I, was part of the party that took Felix for his very first time to Japan. Mm -hmm. And oh, wow. um, another funny story, which connects Felix and Anthony, is that I sold a bunch of pages from Preacher Number One years ago to Anthony. And it was like a 90-minute a, a pitch to, um, to agree on a price. Because, you know, Anthony and his poker playing. But, um, and he immediately flipped it for twice as much to Felix. And I didn't know that Felix was collecting artwork back then and specifically was looking for preacher pages. And I wasn't upset that I didn't make as much as Anthony made on the pages. I was upset because it cost Felix twice as much to get it. But um, right, his right. is insane. Like he has the best collection of comic art maybe assembled outside of maybe, you know, Steve Jeppe. I agree. Um, Felix has a very, very envious art collection. I've never, uh, you know, I, I check it out at least once a month because just because I love looking at the pieces he has. I mean, he has, he has a a great Killing Joke page. I mean, uh, yeah, the, he a collection worth uh, killing for almost because yeah, he's, he he does. He's been very fortunate and and he and he has just good timing and that's kind of I think yeah. what's helped him in his art in his selection of the people that he wants to work with. You know, I think he doesn't just go out and rep just anybody. He he really represents people that he he appreciates and he's got a really good eye for talent and good art and uh, no, very, very savvy gentleman. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have known him. I, I built his website. I, I really, you know, we were just talking the other day about when we, about when this whole NFT, the issue came up, you know, I said, I called him up and we were like, how do we, how can we make something work that uh, you know, kind of get you online with Jason so we can talk about it and yeah. just at least to get it out there because I mean, I've looked into crypto for a long time, so I, I get it. I don't own any, and I, and I never would want to because I just it. 
I just it's something I just can't bring myself to do. But I, I can I can see it. I can get it. I like your idea of the card yeah. with the scratch off and everything. That I might I might go for that. You know, because the meme yeah. is, is it, the meme isn't going to cost me. You know, the, the several thousand dollars I'm sure. But it's something interesting and it's a way to introduce you to the whole concept of how the of how something can exist in the blockchain. I I, I saw a lot of interesting comments. Not not that we should be, this is something I should be talking about on Tuesday. But one of the things that I thought was most interesting, you know, the blockchain concept is that it um it it establishes provenance for anything when, yeah. when it's on there. And I think a big thing with art collectors and why I think that they'll be pushed back at, you know from ever I mean art will probably eventually physical art will eventually somehow be tracked on the blockchain but i think that the the issue a lot of collectors will have is they like to be private especially collectors in europe yeah. and so the idea that uh, they're going to want their names and purchase dates and potentially the prices that they paid all part of this historical record on the blockchain is isn't going to go over as smoothly as i think everybody thinks it will i mean some people will want it because the no having the provenance of, for a piece of art is really important but I, I think that there's still going to be some trepidation from a lot of collectors when when that time comes, and yeah. uh, it will it will happen. But I, I I think that that's going to be one of the things that keeps people uh, out of it and keeps their artwork you know out of being cataloged like that. Yeah, we'll see. Indeed. Yes, exactly. So, why don't we uh, do the usual thing? Tell me how, you know, how and when, you know, you got started in comics and particularly in comic art, because I think for you, just from the little I know about you, comic art was a, was a very early, you know, thing for you. You know, the, the artwork was very important. So spill your guts. Yeah. So um, I actually, the first piece of artwork I ever purchased, I bought from a classmate in elementary school. Um, I, th I think I paid him 50 cents for it. And I still own it. And it was a drawing um, by a kid in my class named John Ray. And it was Thanksgiving. And most other kids were, you know, tracing their thumb in their, in their hands to make a turkey. And he drew a complete full-on hooded executioner with a guillotine with a turkey in it. And <laughs> I was so blown away by it, by the audacity of it, which was fantastic. Um, and he was definitely like a, a bit of a rebel. But um, it was just really, really good drawing. And, and I was like, you know, John, would you ever sell that? And he was like, you mean like for money? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, um, I don't know. He's like, why don't you just, you know, buy me a bag of chips and a Coke? And so now, now you know how old I am when a bag of chips and a Coke was about 50 cents. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, on a schoolyard, basically. But mm -hmm. um, I still have it. And when um, I started buying comics young as well, um, I learned to read really, really young. Um, like around three, four years old, I could read at probably a third or fourth grade level. And um, so my grandmother would buy me comics to keep me up on bigger words because children's books were really simple, but comic books were actually written a little bit more sophisticated. And she trusted that comics wouldn't have any objectionable material. She never really looked in any of them, which was fantastic. Um, but, you know, I mentioned Werewolf by Night 32 because that was one of those comics that I remember buying in the newsstand and that made a huge impact. Um, my birthday is two weeks before Halloween. I was born in Salem, Massachusetts. Horror is in my blood. Um, you know, I, uh, I later on in life, I'd end up working for companies like Blue Underground and Anchor Bay and on like all the major kind of special edition packaging of different horror films, but it starts there. And I was really lucky because we had a lot of local talent and, you know, the town I grew up in, Lynn, Massachusetts, uh, was also home to Tom, Tom Snagoski, who was a huge mentor of mine as a, as a kid. Um, uh, we hung out at Cole's Comics. Uh, Tim Cole just sold his store to finally retire. And, um, you know, it was like a hub, you know, for all these these kids from different parts of what was kind of a rough and tumble town. And, you know, I walked in. There was an episode of Simon and Simon got me collecting again because I collected on the newsstand. And the three comics that I remember buying on the newsstand and they're from very different eras. So I'm thinking that Darren, the kid whose parents owned the store, would just put his own comics on the rack occasionally. And, um, you know, that's whatever you know, the newsstand was unpredictable in the seventies. Anyways, you, you couldn't necessarily follow a book month after month because if they weren't selling enough of it, they wouldn't buy it. So you'd constantly just change. 
And I remember buying Hulk 205, which was the death of Jarella. And so mm -hmm. an early comic and the death of an important character. And I didn't realize they could kill people in comics. And um, later on, like Hulk 235, I think it was with um, Machine Man. I really fell in love with the character Machine Man. But um, later on, in like 1984, 85, there was an episode of Simon and Simon where the plot of the episode re revolved around characters in a comic book. And uh, Noah Hathaway, who was in The NeverEnding Story, is this kid who reaches out to the Simon brothers to investigate the death of his grandfather. And he thinks a character in the comic killed his grandfather. And it turns out that all the people in the comic are based on real people. And what stuck in my head was that it wasn't issue number one. It was a later issue. And that actually made me think, well, I wonder if my Werewolf by Night comic that I've had all these years is actually worth money now. You know, it's number 32, but I think it's the first Moon Knight. And that really kind of spiked in my head that it was really about the narrative made these comics worthwhile. That the same thing that I loved about the comics, good storytelling, good characters, was financially viable. That it wasn't just issue number one, and then as they went down, they became less valuable. Um, and I also remember buying that last issue of Star Wars off the newsstand, which is probably worth more than issue number two, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because of the low print runs and people now pay attention to that stuff. Uh, and certainly for years they didn't. But um, Steve Bissett was living in Vermont. His first wife was from Lynn. And so he would come and visit quite a bit and he was working on Swamp Thing. And so he's working with Alan Moore. So we'd get all the skinny from Steve Bissett when he would go into this comic shop about what Alan Moore was working on. And it, I mean, there was no internet. You know, so you would you would hear these rumors from the people's mouths, you know, and occasionally a story would reach the level that someone at Comic Buyer's Guide might write something about it. Or, um, you know, the comic scene had been around, certainly, and um, Preview Magazine, uh, which was Stranko's um, half comics, half erotic uh, photo book uh, magazine yeah, that he um, had. I remember it, yeah. Hard sneaking that into the house. And... Um, <laughs> And then there was um, Amazing Heroes. And mm -hmm. so that like, I wish I still had a complete run of Amazing Heroes because that was such a great reference for some of the best interviews ever given in comics. And I preferred it to Comics Journal because it wasn't snobby. But mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that era was fantastic. And we found out that you know, Steve had grown up 20 minutes away from Frank Miller, you know, before Frank Miller moved to New York City. And, you know, the Veach brothers were from Vermont. So there's like this mm -hmm. weird connection between in New England of the type of stuff I was reading, I think. And I think that we really got into Alan Moore because of Steve. And, you know, that kind of changed everything. That was sort of like what set the light off in my head about this is this is something I want to be around for the rest of my life. But I did end up buying um, a cover um from steve that i took like a whole summer of working at that comic shop to pay off if i remember correctly i think it was six hundred dollars um and that was with the the comic shops premium put on top of it but that was the most expensive thing i think i'd ever purchased in my life um it was definitely more than my bmx bikes which weren't cheap but you know piece by piece i don't think they eclipsed that uh and so the the worm was kind of uh had turned the the seed was planted you know, I was I was on my way. That's great. I, I actually went to school in Beverly. So uh, when I went Beverly to Beverly Mass. Yeah. Yeah. I went to Montserrat College of Art. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I was in Salem all the time and I lived so, in I lived in Gloucester and Manchester. Gloucester, by the sea. Yeah. 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 So, you know where the McDonald's <laughs> is before you cross the bridge from Salem into Beverly. Of course. Yeah. They make that turn so that there was a bar right across the street. So mm -hmm. I saw um, the, um, oh my gosh, Joe Perry play like two shows a day after he got kicked out of Aerosmith for too much drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were like little kids, so we couldn't go in the bar. So we would have to sit in the booth that was right next to those swinging doors to see the stage. And whenever someone walked through, we'd get a clear shot of the stage and we would applaud. But he was really shy about the fact that there were these kids there with like old Aerosmith records for him to sign. And he was really sweet to us. But um, that was the level of talent that was actually just hanging out in Beverly on, on any given uh, weeknight, you know, in the in the late 70s. Yeah. 
<clears throat> that's that's pretty crazy. And hey, I want to show that picture of you when you were probably uh, yeah, you ready? Fifteen, probably. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, that's crazy. You, you have you have a good selection of comics on the wall. And, yep, uh, all ECs. Okay. So it was a row yep. of ECs. The uh, the two promo posters from the comic shop for Watchmen. It was the Roar Shark and the Comedian one. Um, that's a reissue Clockwork Orange, and that's the original um, 3D poster for Friday the 13th. And it's interesting because I would then end up representing uh, Ray Zone's estate later on in life. And oh, Ray had done, you know, everything 3D. Right. I was going to ask you about, well, that was one of the questions later on about Ray Zone. I was yeah. curious. But, uh, Good no, guy. that's... Yeah, that's, uh, Just that's what I've heard. some of his son's chicken for lunch. So, uh, you know, the um, Howlin' Ray's is named after Ray, and mm -hmm. it's Johnny Zone. Uh, Johnny Zone is, is, you know, he's not Michelin starred yet, I don't think, unless he had unless he was starred at, at La Poubelle. But uh, a top flight chef who left a very established restaurant to go to Nashville to learn how to make hot chicken for two years and then came and brought it back to L.A., and it is the best chicken in town. When things were more normal, there would be a line an hour and a half long to buy chicken from him down in Chinatown. I believe it. And uh, hey, T, T. Gleason says you had a sweet mullet. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I did have a sweet mullet. <laughs> and nights of old. Uh, I graduated from Montserrat in 1991. So I lived in Beverly from 86 to 91. And We were uh, there for the same amount of time for a little while then. So... I graduated high school in 89 and came to California in 90. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we were there at yeah. the exact same time. I mean, yep. I got there in the summer of 86. So, uh, and then I just, I was, I was slow. It took me five years to get through school. But I lived in uh, Maine for about a year and a half after that and uh, been back in Ohio pretty much ever since then. Well, you did the right thing. Like I always tell, as a, as a gallery owner, I always tell kids, in school, if you can take a term off, take a term off to kind of digest what you just learned. Um, it's not as bad back east where you have sort of two terms and then you've got some time off. But out here, you know, Art Center has three terms a year. So they're working around the calendar and rushing them through. And they really don't have enough time to absorb what they just learned before they get, you know, headed straight into the next thing. I hear you. And uh, Knights of the Old, yeah, you, uh, I was in the old, uh, the music theater days of Montserrat. You, you were in that uh, building downtown, which was very nice as well. Um, I, made, I made a couple visits there as an alumni because, you know, I love that school. I love the area. So yeah. I, wish I wish I had the time to go back, but not anymore. I, but, but they had a great curriculum, a great, great set of teachers at that place, too. But no, I mean, that, that, oh, I that should, is true. I should say that I wasn't at Montserrat. I was in Massachusetts in those years. Yes. So yes, I, I graduated um, St. Mary's in 19, uh, 1989. Very good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Mikhail says I should go to someplace warm. But one day, Mikhail, I will. But, uh, you know, it's actually colder down south, I think, right now than it is here in, in Ohio. Texas, it's like a horrible uh, snowstorm that's knocking everybody's water and electricity out. Exactly. I mean, and they only have like three inches of snow. I, we have, I have two foot of snow out there right now. So, yeah, but, yeah. but, uh, but I'm used to it and I work from home, so I don't have to go anywhere. You know, at the end of the day, it works out pretty well for me. Uh, yeah, Sweeney and Gavin, right. Ethan Barry was my favorite teacher. So, uh, uh, sorry, not, not, not to divert. I just haven't talked about these guys in 20 years. So, um, <laughs> That's awesome. but, uh, but so, um, at what point, you know, you, you, you go to the West coast and how did all the gallery concepts start? You know, was that something that you always were thinking about wanting to do? Um, you know, how did, how did you make that transition from being an early art collector to, you know, running galleries and, and things like that? So it was, it was a completely sideways thing. Um, I came out to LA, um, you know, to be a rock star and, um, that wasn't, I did actually get signed to a record label and then nothing happened, which is frequent. This is a regular Hollywood story, but, um, I got a job at a comic shop by selling my comic book collection to them and they didn't know how to price it. So they hired me to price the comic collection that I had just sold them. And that shop, which was on Highland in Hollywood was called fantastic store. And it had like a giant paper mache thing hanging over the top of it. So fantastic store instead of fantastic four. 
Yeah. And um, it was a shop because it was in Hollywood. A lot of Hollywood people would shop there. There was Golden Apple, which everybody knew about. And then there was like this other shop where you could maybe get a better deal on stuff. And Quentin Tarantino was a regular there. He wasn't famous yet. Um, they ended up shooting True Romance there. And so I ended oh, cool. up set decorating the comic shop in True Romance. So that I thought they wanted Batman because it was a Warner Brothers movie. And we got a call the night before saying, no, it's got to be Spider-Man. So I had to go back in and do that whole wall again with all classic Spider-Man stuff. And um, so it's supposed to be a Detroit comic shop because Hollywood was so blown out looking then that it could pass for Detroit. Mm -hmm. Love Detroit. Nothing bad to say about Detroit. But it was it, it, it was an interesting thing. And um, and I ended up quitting that job with a little bit of fanfare, um, not being able to get um, – a federal holiday off. We were all getting paid under the table. We worked 12 hours a day, like no days off. And I had like a good six months without a day off. And I wanted a day off on the 4th of July. They wouldn't give it to me. So I quit. And so I was out of work for a couple of weeks and a friend of ours living in this kind of building full of rockers was like, you're always talking about art and stuff. There's this great gallery down on Melrose you should check out. And he, I like kind of hopped in the back of a motorcycle, went down there and filled out an application. And the guy I passed my application into was from Lynn, Massachusetts. <laughs> and he had moved when he was 12 and went to Florida. And so when I went into junior high school, the kids that he knew in elementary school became my friends, but I had never met him. Mm -hmm. So we knew all the same people. And so my application got kind of passed to the top of the pile. And I spent a little, like a couple of months in the shop, the bookstore, which is called Silk Plant. And then I got moved upstairs into the gallery, which was Lovelace de Jesus. Worked there for several years. Um, I actually got kind of pulled off of register one day by Mel Brooks, who was shooting a commercial down the street. And I started acting and did a ton of commercials, did a lot of pilots. Um, I've recently, pretty much the only acting I do now are for friends of mine who are like, Hey, we've got a, a scene that we want to do. Can you fill this? And then I end up getting featured. But um, I was in SAG for years um, and that kind of led to a lot of other things too. But it was working at that gallery that really showed me that what I thought had to be a gallery of kind of, you know, the supermodel and the black turtleneck at the front, you know, desk that doesn't talk to you as you walk in, gives you stink eye, nothing's priced, that there was another model that wasn't that. And mm -hmm. um, Melissa de Jesus had done uh, art shows for Robert Williams, for Joe Coleman, um, for S. Clay Wilson. Um, while I was there, we did shows with X and O for Clay, for Robert, for Joe. Um, we did the Zap 13 show while I was there. <clears throat> and actually, cool. the photo cool. of everybody, the photo that I took that's been republished in every single collected edition. Mm -hmm. But um, that really kind of turned the worm for me. I was like, this is really cool. This is something maybe I would like to do, but it wasn't something I could do then. I was too busy doing other things. And later, much later, uh, when I kind of started to burn out on, on the entertainment industry, at this point I was in production. I had run my own studio, I had worked for the guys behind IRS Records at a place called Liberation. The collapse happened in 2008. I'm like, I need out. And um, had a few months off and the owner of that gallery approached me and asked me if I wanted to, to run his gallery. And I, I thought about it and I asked him, you know, how many hours it would be. And, uh, we joke, he says, Oh, you know, 20, 24 hours. I didn't realize it was a day, but, um, you know, got caught up quickly and, and kind of, you know, shepherded that place through what was a really bad time for most galleries. And we did pretty well. And we did a, a few, innovative things that kind of changed the way that we did business. But I was able to do the first modern survey of, of comic art, you know, that wasn't, that was superheroes, that wasn't, you know, underground art. Mm -hmm. And was also able to give Steve Rude his first like legitimate art gallery exhibition, you know, that wasn't in a comic shop, you know, that was in a fine art gallery. So there was a lot of still connection back to comics. And when you're selling art to fine art collectors, like the way that you would normally label things, you know, you put a painting on a wall and it has the artist's name, it's got the title, maybe it has the medium, maybe the size and the price. You can't do that with comic art. Like it's just too important. There's too many factors that go into why this page is this price. Mm -hmm. And since my 
interest was in collaborations, you know, the great writers working with their, the artists that made these comics special. Um, it really had to be explained. And so I was writing these, you know, 400 word descriptions of each piece. And I'm at, after 40 of these, I'm like, this is a book. Like, I, this can't just live, you know, as right. we say, it can't just live digitally. I've put too much work into this. This has to be a book. So we, we published it as an 80 page giant. And um, we published cool. it through Ask Gasp uh, with Lola de Jesus Press. And that, that was pop sequentialism. And um, it was just to kind of pay attention to modern comic art, you know, the dark age, if you will, 1986 onward. And mm -hmm. there was no way we we're going to get any Dark Knight pages to sell. So Dark Knight is is very obviously absent. But I was able to get a color um, proof from Watchmen, which served as the cover. Uh, worked extensively with a lot of the guys that you named at the top of the show. You know, I worked with, you know, everybody from the Donnellys to, um, you know, Splash Page to um, um, Critics' Choice even. You know, I, I didn't think mm -hmm. I was going to be able to come to terms with him on pieces. And at the end, I was able to. And it was, you know, they all, I thanked everybody. And when we, it finally got published, um, I, I dropped off a stack for everybody at their tables at, at Comic-Con. And immediately they wanted to sell me more comic art. And I was like, well, you know, I, I've just done that show. And you, and that's right. not the way you do a show. You know, in an art exhibition, you contact an artist and you, you put their art in the wall. And if it sells, you take half and they take half and you give them back what doesn't sell. But putting together a survey show like that, I had to buy everything. And exactly. I had to put in pieces that I had collected over the years because it had to be what I wanted it to be. And it couldn't just be, you know, an odds and sods kind of thing. It really had to be important. And it was important to me to have important pages, if possible, from these important collections. And I was able to have some amazing stuff from Frank Quitely, um, you know, thanks to, um, oh, my gosh, uh, I can't think of his name. He handled Frank Whiteley for years. Uh, Mitch. Great guy. Mitch, Mitch. Yeah. 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 Mitch, Mitch used to rap Frank. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I bought, I bought some, well, three or four pages, you know, from uh, Mitch when Frank was there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's a, no, Mitch was always good. Good like that. I mean, he's still, he's still doing a great job. I mean, he does more consignment work now than rap repping, but yeah. You know, he's, he's, and he's gone into stuff. the pulp too. So he's doing a lot of pulp art. Um, he had yeah. an amazing, he had the original artwork to Apocalypse Now, the movie poster. Mm -hmm. That's true. He had the Bob Peak, and I think that sold, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, for less than $10,000. Today, today that could be $60,000. You know, um, when I was first working at that comic shop, you know, one of the people that came in was, was Glenn Danza came in a lot. He had a huge collection mm -hmm. of comic art. And every once in a while, he'd be like, how oh, do you think you guys can sell comic art? So one of our clients was the Holland brothers. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Eddie, the guys who wrote every Motown song and they were sports card collectors and they were buying a lot of sports cards for me. And so was um, James Earl Jones. And I upgraded them all from just buying sports cards to buying original comic art. So the Hollands have pages from like early Tim Vigil stuff. They've got the cover to Green Lantern 58. They've got, um, my old Captain America that I got from Jack Kirby, which is the double page splash from, um, actually, no, it's a single page splash from Marvel Treasury Edition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember going to Jack's house, taking three buses from Hollywood to Thousand Oaks and bringing back like this giant piece of artwork on the bus, you know, that I just paid him, I think, I think I paid him $400 for it. And I, um, I think it was, I, I, he had like stacks of artwork that he had just gotten back. So this was right after he won that first lawsuit to get his mm -hmm. artwork back from Marvel. And, you know, he was still in the back cover of like all the Eclipse comics, you know, it's Marvel's 25th anniversary. What about Jack? And, um, and he, he was like, he had that kind of gruff demeanor, but he was a super sweet guy. And, uh, um, you know, Roz was great too. He'd go over there and he'd bring out like a glass of iced tea or Kool-Aid or something. And um, it's like, oh, well, he's just finishing up something in the other room. And, you know, you, <laughs> the toilet flush or something. And then he'd come out and you'd go into the studio. And it was just piles of artwork everywhere. And he's like, oh, what do you want, Kennedy? What, what, what do you like? And I was like, Thor. Can't have Thor. It's like, but 
I've got this great Captain America, and he's kind of like produces it like a magician from behind him. And like I said, it was huge. It was not standard comic book size paper and not even like golden age, like giant. It was big. It was a big poster board. And, um, and I had to sell that that year, like immediately. But I mean, it was, it was like a, like I say, I think I paid 400 bucks. I think I sold it for 2000. I thought I'd made the greatest deal of my life. And again, what's that worth now? You know, right. like that's, that could be upwards of a hundred thousand dollars, you know, in today's market. Um, but you know, I, I learned as someone who collected and, and really sold stuff, not to get too attached to anything. And there's not too, there's not too many art pieces that I've owned that I've let go that I, I feel bad not owning anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one that I sold a couple years ago that I didn't really need to sell that I did, but the guy kind of hit my number and I was like, well, if he's willing to pay that, you know, I should let him have it because he appreciates it more than I do. And um, it was the, the splash of um, Dick Grayson as Batman and from Jock from his run on detective where he's jumping back in the air and it's, it's a classic image and they made a toy out of it and everything. But um, the, uh, the buyer who, who got it from me was a really, really good guy. And there had been like a lot of back and forth with a few other people that were serious, but not serious. Right. Well, Jock's work is, you know, very, well, I love his work. Absolutely. And, and he's just, uh, he's definitely skyrocketed the last couple of years. I mean, you, you, you yeah. know, small sketches are going for $800 and things, you know, that I, I just, you look at it and I should have got in early because I, I, I'm close friends with Mark Hay, as you know, and yep. he's, re he's repped him for so long. And Mark's great. I see him every time he comes to town. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh yeah. So I, I regret all the times that I could have gotten something from him and I didn't, you know, but that's, I got that's super goes. lucky because I had, included jock and pop sequentialism i included a cover for scalped oh cool and when i dropped off that stack at mark's booth mark's like oh hey if you like i got this great new stack of jock stuff and i was like i don't know man i don't know and he's like oh no he's doing this thing in detective it's like people are really starting to talk about it. there's this new writer and i was like and i didn't want to be rude so i was like yeah okay i'll look at it and i saw that page and i was like oh yeah, I think I, I think you, I need to buy that. You, you know, need and, <laughs> you know, my, my favorite character is Robin because right. you know, in my head, all of us could be Robin. You know, like he's not super powered. I, the only thing, if only I were an orphan, you know, that that I could have been adopted by a billionaire, um, you know, a, nihil, a nihilistic billionaire narcissist who would train me to be a superhero, and uh, boy, would my life be different. But. Um, I, I sort of feel like in a way Robin is a metaphor for all young men that we're trying to get out of the shadow of this, this person, our dad or whatever. And that's Robin's story is he's really like every man. And when he becomes his own character as Nightwing, it's, it's him finally becoming his own person. Um, but I still, I've got great affinity for that Teen Titans run, you know, with Marv Wolfman and, and George Perez, but I even like yeah. the old Teen Titans, you know, the, um, the stuff from the, the late sixties, that is just like the weirdest stories. And even reading them in the late seventies, like all this campus politics of the sixties, it's, it seemed relevant. It seemed like it, it had aged really, really well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, uh, I've never been a DC guy. And that, that was a period of time that I couldn't get into because the stories just, they didn't resonate with me. Like, Marvel stories did, you know, and I, yeah. I don't know. I kind of regret it now because if I had the time, I'd love to go back and read read that era, you know, yeah. of of DC Comics because I I literally skipped everything from like the you know say the mid seventies till 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 about Perez Teen you know Teen Titans that was what sucked that was really when yeah. I started buying uh, DC Comics again. And I mean, you, th that's that's when they got ridiculously good though too. I mean. And if you were reading, if you're following like Amazing Heroes or anything, it was always John Byrne and George Perez, you know. Right. And so, um, you know, when when Byrne was off X Men and was the, the Fantastic Four that he was doing, I just I fell in love with that. And it, it's a shame that they've never been able to capture, or not yet, but they haven't yet been able to capture that kind of magical quality that Byrne brought to the Fantastic Four after years of it being a fairly irrelevant comic. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And just, I mean, it's his reboot of Superman was, you know, obviously industry changing and Man of Steel and all that. We were all very, very excited about it. But, um, you know, Justice League, you know, I always wish that I could have owned um, a really nice page from Kevin Maguire, you know, from that Justice League run, which was the comic that I think I probably looked forward to reading more than any other because it was just so aloof. Mm -hmm. You know, there was nothing else like it on the market because Keith Giffen was so gifted with humor and James DeMatteis was great at kind of giving body to these these broad stroke ideas that Giffen would have. And when I went back and I, I have appreciation for Giffen's Legion, but I didn't read it when it was coming out. Mm -hmm. And um, and now when I go back and look at it, it's I sort of feel like he had realized a lot of what Kirby had been wanting to get to with the new gods and just didn't have a chance because it was canceled. Um, but that it was, it was hard to digest those characters, as you say, you know, like there's just, there were too many characters in the DC universe and the X-Men certainly got like that after a time, you know, when you get past Paul Smith and past even the John Romita Jr. era and somewhere between that and them getting, you know, juice with the public again with Jim Lee and Wolf Potasio and stuff, you'd pick it up. And I didn't, I didn't know who the X-Men were anymore. Like month mm -hmm. after month, if, if you were gone for six months, it was like, I don't know what this is anymore. I can't read it. Um, and I was sort of looking forward to more finite things again. And so I had, I had started to really love things like mage, which was 15 issues um, would love to have, you know, a beautiful color page from mage or from Grendel you know, in, in the backup story, uh, uh, Grendel and Mage from that era, which I think is some of the best artwork that came out in the era. Um, loved Cerebus, oddly, as a, as a young kid um, and was lucky enough to be reading it early on. Like, I, I never owned a Cerebus number one, but I think I was able to pick up from, like, number six onward um, before I moved up to California. Car, uh, somebody asked, Carlos asked a question, any art pop up yet? From from what, Carlos? I'm sorry I missed the uh, when your question came up, but if he asks again, I'll, I'll know. But uh, but yeah, no, Mage was one of my favorite comics. I mean, that period, you know, I, you know, Robert Wagner was great, and uh, and Mage was probably my favorite book, like, next to the Elementals. You know, that was just kind of my, yeah. that was my thing back then. But uh, well, Mage, yeah, yeah, the... The, um, El the Elemental Special was kind of a really important book that I don't think gets its credit. You know, one of the first books to really address child abuse in, in mm -hmm. any kind of real way. I saw also in the comments that Ruben asked about uh, Charles Binger's daughter. Um, I just spoke to Roz yesterday. So um, I'm going to be representing um, Charles Binger's estate again. And we're looking to do a Charles Binger book, uh, probably with a publisher named New, New Texture, who have done a lot of books on the men's adventure pulp uh, covers. So um, stuff to look forward to, Ruben. So you know Ruben as well then? <laughs> I just happened to see the comment. <laughs> okay, you know, I, I wasn't, well, before we got started, I knew you were doing this on your phone and I wasn't sure, you know, if you, if you were able actually gonna, to be able to see the comments really well or not. So I have good. my laptop holding up my phone so it doesn't move. I just, uh, I don't have a camera on my laptop. Like I, I disabled it years ago and never got it put back in. And then this, this Apple laptop, I can't upgrade. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's no support for it anymore. So it would be a waste to even install anything. The right. software wouldn't run it. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great paperweight. It keeps my phone uh, where it needs to be. Uh, <laughs> but I, I've got a PC for everything else. Yeah, no, that's how I am. I, I've got a, it's almost nine year old uh, MacBook Pro and I use it just yeah. for email, you know, but I do all of my video editing and any Photoshop work I do on a PC. I've just always been more comfortable on there, but I, I, I like the Mac for its portability, but it, I, I've never used it for anything but, but email, you know, yeah. so I, it's my take on the road type of thing. So uh, I'm, I'm like the opposite of what most Mac users are, you know, but that's yeah. all right. That's all right. So, uh, so yes, Ruben thanked you, and he said he, he bought uh, several Binger paintings uh, from you years oh, back. Right on. Yeah, because we did we did two or three shows uh, for Charles Binger's work, and um, there's there's actually one or two pieces that were never included in those shows that were in Roz's collection that were for a time too precious to her. 
that um, I think we'll we'll be offering up for sale. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Charles, uh, Charles Finger did almost all of Ray Bradbury's uh, paperback covers, um, almost all of Elvis Huxley, did all the illustration work for Marilyn Monroe, but he was actually wow. already an old man at that point. Like he had been a painter during the um, the um, during World War One uh, for the Royal Air Force, and there's like gigantic murals apparently in British Air Force bases in England that he had done. And in between World War One and World War Two, he was painting like the crown heads of Europe. Like he was a commission painter that painted very wealthy and well-known people. And mm -hmm. they were sort of like after World War Two, and a lot of the the art scene in Europe was completely decimated from, you know, the French schools were destroyed. You know, a lot of artists who were of Jewish heritage were, were killed in the Holocaust. Um, you know, even places like Italy, which you don't think of as being heavily bombed, uh, there was large destruction in, in a lot of the painting schools, which is why, um, you know, in 1945 or so, Peggy Guggenheim really changed the face of modern art by backing abstract expressionism as the American art form, knowing that it was impossible to compete with the great, you know, painting traditions of Europe. Sure. Um, so he came to Hollywood and got here at the right time to illustration was still a big thing and movie stars wanted the type of painter that they had seen paint beautiful women in museums. Mm -hmm. And so Marilyn like really demanded that Charles Finger be hired for all of her movie poster work. Um, but most of that stuff, you know, of course, as you know, the artists don't get to keep it. It goes to a publisher. They never get it back. But Charles was able to keep a few, and, and we certainly had the paperback for Eilis in Gaza, which is an uh, Aldous Huxley book. Mm -hmm. We had the, on the Day of the Locust. We had the original painting for Day of the Locust, which he had been able to keep, which is considered one of the, the 50 best paperback covers of all time. So um, he was mistaken for Charles Bureau for years because his signature uh -huh. wasn't totally readable. So a lot of his paintings were misattributed to somebody and since there'd never been a book about him his paintings when they go to auction don't go for as much as they probably should and heritage has this idea of what they've gotten for prior work so they don't see they don't take into consideration what i've been able to sell the work for but um you know i think that will all change when we get a book out on them sure sure well now i understand ruben's interest in uh in Binger because he's he's a huge paperback uh illustration collector so i'll have uh, to shoot me an email ruben because i've got access to some other stuff that i think you'll be really interested in too right ruben's collection is so large that he has to have two calf galleries one for his paperback art and one for his comic art so amazing uh, yeah no no absolutely uh, i i really admire ruben's collection and we, we have similar tastes in comic book artwork unfortunately <laughs> cool. so, uh, and uh, Nick Catradis wanted to know exactly where, you, where your gallery was located and what's the name. Oh, my gallery is Gallery 30 South. Uh, we're in Pasadena, California. Uh, 30 South is actually also the address. It's 30 South Wilson Avenue. We're on the same street as Caltech. Um, we're right around the corner from the Pasadena Playhouse by a few blocks. Um, Old Town is just about 10 blocks away. And um, Pasadena City College is about five blocks in the other direction. So um, pretty centrally located. It's a very small spot. It's like a 1930s hat box of a building. Um, we're pretty sure that it's um, a Lloyd Wright, not Frank Lloyd Wright, but his son, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., most commonly attributed as Lloyd Wright uh, Construction, who was working with um, a few other, he never worked with his dad, he worked with a few other well-known architects at the time. And if you kind of bang on the wall, you can you can hear it just like absorbs the noise. Like it's that 1930s concrete. That's why we were getting that echo earlier. <laughs> yeah, it bounces. There, there's like one temporary wall in the middle that eats a little bit of the noise, but I uh, next time we'll, we'll drop some pillows around or something to eat the sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My kids do recording in the other room and they've got the padding up all over it. It's a... Uh... Yeah, because because other yes, well, I don't know where they got it, but it, yeah, it's it's like the A card, but it is foam. But uh, that's what they did. Yeah, they, they just staple gunned it all there. I can't wait to, for the day when I've got to go clean that room up. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but hey, before we look at some art, uh, 
Knights of Old asked about the, and it's something you mentioned when we were in the green room earlier about uh, uh, the. Oh, no, I clicked the wrong one. There we go. Uh, the Japan trip uh, with Felix. You know, what was that all about with with Felix? And can you talk? Felix about was that a big all? toy collector then, so he he had he was a guy who owned a couple of like yogurt stands and I think a dry cleaners, and he was a big toy collector, and so Gaston from Meltdown I think charged a couple guys to go on a trip to all the toy stores in Japan. And I'd already been on that trip. So um, Tom Frank and Gaston and I, and, um, and a few other people had been to Japan before. And on that previous trip, I'd actually met my, my former wife. And the, the second trip I think was Tony Preto and huge, like the world's authority on transformers and Felix mm -hmm. and a couple other guys. And so uh, every day we would wake up about six o'clock in the morning and we would hit a new toy store all day, come back, just like kind of bask in the glow of our beautiful Japanese toy booty and, um, <laughs> and then do the same thing like the next day. Um, the first year we went, it was actually the only year that Wonder Festival and Supercon were in the same week. So we're actually mm -hmm. able to hit both in one trip and it was, it was really eye-opening, but they were able to set up deals with the toy wholesalers um, in the toy districts in outside of Jimbocho. And um, so it was a really, it was a worthwhile trip for them. And, and that's why I didn't know that Felix collected comic art because I only knew him as a toy collector for years. Right. That's funny. Yeah. And I, I, I did know that he was big into toys before he got into comic art, but, uh, but like you said, he's, he's probably been collecting for just, almost just as long with the original yeah. art as well. So why don't we? Uh, a lot of jumbo uh, in that trip. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I have actually never been to Japan. That is, uh, my daughter always wanted to go, and she graduates high school this year. And I and I, I had always told her that that was the trip we were going to do. But I I think we're you know because of COVID and everything, we're going to do something else this summer, and put yeah. that trip off to maybe when she graduates college or something. Because yeah, it's just it's not worth it. But yeah, but we've but we've been wanting to do it. We've been talking about it for like five years that this was going to be yeah. our trip. So I'm you gotta go sometime. I mean, it's there's no place else like it. Like um, Japan is it's its own world. It's it's. I mean, I, you could drop me in, it in the middle of uh, Nagano, Broadway, and leave me there for a week. Like, and and seriously, like, just leave me there. Like, you there are places you can even sleep there. Like, it's it's its own environment. There's like ten different <laughs> mandarake shops. There's like, cause I was a big movie poster collector too. And I ended up, I licensed a lot of Japanese films. So um, on that, my second trip to Japan, I was only buying movie posters. So um, I, I released, I had a company called Panic House and I released the, the Pinky Violence box set and did all these films with, um, I didn't do the Meiko Kaji films, but I did the films with um, Miki Sugimoto and, um, Reiko Ike, and they've become kind of iconic as a result of the releases that I did. Um, ironically, uh, the company that ended up releasing some of those films afterwards on like Blu-ray is Arrow, and I now work with Arrow. So um, it's it's a it's a weird kind of journey I've had. Like I've always been like like the Forrest Gump of pop culture or something. Like I'm I'm near these <laughs> these other people that are doing really cool things and I'm able to catch a little bit of a glow off of them and, and move on to the next thing. But um, you know, and someone had mentioned about, you know, trying to monetize knowledge and it, it took years to kind of figure out how to do that. Right. And right. you know, and to even like buying and producing films, I felt weird putting my name on it because, you know, I wasn't the filmmaker you know, and that type of thing. But I think that at a certain, at a certain point, you sort of have to, you know, if not plant your flag in the ground, be like, Hey, you know, like I'm over here, guys, <laughs> you know, I do these right. things. And you know, I've also, I've also looked generally a lot younger than I am. And so that's, it's been a challenge. Like you, people don't take you seriously in business. It actually it benefited me in Japan because they got a kick out of me. Um, you know, when I was younger, I looked a little bit more like Michael J. Fox than Michael Douglas. <laughs> and, you know, you know, people would say it's like, you know, they hear my name, Kennedy, that I'm from Boston. They're like, you know, oh, you're from Boston. Oh, like the Kennedys. It's like, you're going to love this. It's my passport. And like, oh, and they'd laugh. And then they'd say, you look like Michael J. Fox. And they'd laugh. And I didn't know if this was like a weird Japanese joke that they just told everybody or, 
or not, but um, it was it was it was interesting. Like they they sort of respected in a way. I think you know we're all gaijin, so you're either Japanese, you're not Japanese, and so if you're not Japanese, you're gaijin, which means foreigner, and mm-hmm. so they expect less of you. So if you speak a little bit of Japanese and you're not an oaf. Um, then you you can be pretty popular. You know, you you'll be fun to be around, and it's kind of like, oh hey, d- do that American thing that you do. They don't say that, but it's kind of like they kind of think it, and you kind of instinctively do it. So you kind of <laughs> can't do anything wrong, anyways. So it, you know, as long as you have a certain amount of respect for the culture, you can speak a little bit of the language. It's a fantastic place to go. Most people there actually do speak a little bit of English. Um, my favorite thing was always you can ask anybody anything and. Almost invariably, the first thing they say is, "I don't know, maybe," and then they say what they're gonna say, which is funny because you can't say anything like that in Japanese. Like even <laughs> if you if you give a number, you can't even estimate. You have to give the exact number. It's the way the language works. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it's just a, a paradise of of fun anachronisms. Like you know, you can be you um, Kobe, or you know, you can go to Osaka, and then. Right, um, very close by is, is you know the massive temple district, and it's very remote, but it's still you can see it from the city, and you know in Tokyo you can still see Mount Fuji, you know from Tokyo, and you get in the city, you get to a, across the street, and there's like a hundred thousand people crossing the intersection all at the same time, and everybody's you know they're able just they had mobile phones and devices long before we did, you know. People were texting, you know, on the train, and I didn't know what they were doing in the '90s, you know. And it, it took like really till the early 2000, mid mid aughts, you know, for texting to become a big deal in the U.S. But um, yeah, I mean, if you have any fascination with any part of Japanese culture, you'll have a fantastic time. That's the and the food's pretty great. Yeah, no, no, that, that's that. I'd probably be going there more for the food, honestly. But, yeah. Uh, and uh, Knights of Old asked about, you know, where is uh, the manga art? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, that's that's always going to be the eternal question. I they keep it. <laughs> they keep it all. I know. It's like you, you, you'll almost never, never see it on the market. I know that there's, I, over the years, you know, running CAF, I have talked with numerous people who have aspirations of opening up that, that market, and it's practically impossible. Um, you know, and, and they've they tried. They open their own and, museum. Right, right, so and there was, there was have dedicated museums. There, there was even there was actually a really big exhibit in London, um, like a few months before COVID hit. So it would have been you know probably 14, 16 months ago uh, that mm-hmm. that a friend of mine went to and took a lot of photos and stuff. But that you know you just those just don't happen outside of uh, outside of Japan, unfortunately. So you don't get to see much of that artwork. But um, yeah, so it's always. It's you're just not, you know as far as I can tell we're never going to see the, anything like that on the market probably ever unfortunately I'll, I'll and pop, I know that you I'll can you can collect... up tomorrow yeah well I know that you you have uh, a pretty big animation art collection as well right I mean yeah at least look I, and that I way. don't post most of it it's um and I've actually been doing a lot of private sales but uh you know things like Dragon Ball Z and I had a huge Akira collection at one point. There was one person in Canada who had a larger collection than I did, and he's actually gotten rid of his stuff too. But um, I kept my two favorite pieces. Uh, one was a, a Ganga that was used as production art, and it's, you know, Canada looking over shoulder. It's, it's in my, my gallery. Yeah. And, um, and I just love that shot, and it was used on materials in Japan and materials in the U.S. when – because the, the company that released everything on videotape, you know, VHS back in the day, uh, Streamline Pictures, um, their offices were actually right next door to Glenn Danzig's. And um, when they were closing up shop, someone walked downstairs. It was a place called Bonsai Anime that was on uh, Sepulveda Boulevard in West LA. And uh, my ex-wife worked there uh, with uh, the owner, Enrique, great guy. And... Enrique was out to lunch and this guy came in and he's like, I've got all these animation cells that I want to sell. And um, I was like, well, how much, what do you have and what do you want for it? He's like, I don't even know what's in here. He's like, but I want like, I think he said $300. And I was like, there's an ATM in the bar next door at Gabe's. I went over, I pulled out 300 bucks. I didn't even look in it. 
And right. I just walked over and I flipped open the, I just flipped open the, the top folder as I handed him the money. And it was that Akira shot. And the next shot was just like shot after shot after shot of gold. And um, that amazing Castle Cagliostro Lupin the third piece that mm-hmm. I have was in there and just some really, truly amazing stuff. And I was like, wow, this is, this is going, you know, in the vault. And, um, you know, luckily I'd had a little bit of experience in dealing with animation. And so knew how to store stuff because a lot of people who buy large collections, it gets vinegar syndrome really quickly because of the acetate on the acetate. Like if it's not stored correctly, it's very easily can go bad. People say you can't frame animation. You can absolutely frame animation. You just have to really frame it well. And it's actually better to frame it than to keep it necessarily back to back to back if it's not stored well. And uh, most animation archivists will say that you should not keep them upright. You should keep them flat five high. Hmm. So no more than five high. And so that means a lot of architectural drawers. Um, But uh, there's ways around that too. And, you know, you, you just want to make sure that your humidity is low. Um, don't keep your place too warm. Uh, it's better to, if you have a room that you can keep at a different temperature that's a bit cold, it's better to do that. But um, I've seen a lot of pieces go bad. Not mine, but I've seen a lot of pieces go bad. Yeah. Uh, I bought some for my kids and, you know, my little ponies, they're just wedged together and you just don't want to peel them apart because you know you're going to damage something. So, yeah, I've had bad experience. I had a table full of that stuff at San Diego like 10 years ago, right? Uh, you know, I bought mine through eBay probably about the, around the same time, 12, you know, 10. Yeah. It was probably more like 12 years ago or so. But, uh, but yeah, I was just selling them by like the stack. And I got yep. my stack in the mail and I could barely separate them. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't think I even displayed any one of them, you know, just because I couldn't. So, yeah, I bought them for the kids and oh well. So I bought one of those or a few of those. It was a horse on a phone. And I just saw that and I thought that was the most absurd thing. I had to own it. I had, I needed it in my life. <laughs> yes. Yes. Little, little did we know how popular that would become. But, um, and with who it would become popular with. Right. That's very true. Very true. <laughs> uh, so why don't we look at some art out of your collection? Because yeah. Uh, yeah, I, did, I pulled a few pieces here. Let's, uh, uh, let me see how we go here. Nice lead for Mayo. Yeah, yeah, that, um, I can't remember who I got that from. It might have been Mark. Um, that's the second appearance of the Joker in the Joker graphic novel. Um, and he's, you know, he, it, a lot of people think that he's he's flipping the bird. He's not. He's doing the British thing of the two fingers up. But I love that page because it's it's such a great combination of his pencils, his his ink wash and uh, traditional comic art. But it's also, I wanted to have a panel page for that in the Pop Sequentialism show. And I wanted something that showcased the Glasgow grin. And in the first appearance page, you can't really tell that he has one. And this one, you can tell that he's got his face is cut. Right. Um, I just love that page. No, that's, uh, that one's, I remember when uh, when he was working on that, and Mark first got some of that that work in, and I was blown away by Lee's work, you know, because I had gotten it. I wasn't really familiar with it at the time, and I and just because from hanging out with him, I had bought, I had him do a couple of convention sketches, and I never really got his style, you know, because he would draw, he would do his convention sketches, and he was really just drawing the outlines, and I yeah. thought it was cool, but I, you know, and I and I was happy to have him, but I didn't get it, and then I when I saw. This this graphic novel, I really understood, you know, how, what Lee's method was, and I was just blown away. It made me appreciate the the just the line work that he had done in those early pieces that I got, because then you see how he's inked it, you know, inked in the Joker in that bottom panel, and it's just yeah. absolutely beautiful. And yeah, uh, yeah, I love his work, and I, I hear he's doing a little bit more digital work these days, which is unfortunate, because I mean, I, I know, I, you know, his work is absolutely phenomenal. I love the Raphael uh, Albuquerque's like that too, right? You know, like yeah. you see a lot of Raphael stuff, and he's got like that stark black and white, and then you see American Vampire, mm-hmm. and you've got like the front of that book is the very stark black and white, and the back end of these beautiful pencils that to me are up there with Frank Quitely, and right. you just kind of wish that 
he didn't ink it or didn't let anybody ink it that you could just see what's in that pencil work. And, you know, I've got the two most important pages from that issue. You know, I've got from American vampire number one, I've got the first appearance of, of Skinner sweet. And then I've got his origin where the, the vampire blood drops into his mouth while they're fighting. Right. And that one, I will never let go. Like, you know, it's, it's a Stephen King written comic book, the back end of that story, which is fantastic. But um, that action and, you know, Michael Choi too, like Michael Choi, his work was never treated well in printing. The, the color that they put on his work in X-23 had this almost like really saturated digital overlay that completely buried his pencils. And his panel pages, his action panel pages in X-23, I wish they would just republish it in black and white for people to see. And he doesn't do that style anymore. He's kind of become a more realistic penciler. Um, and so he's gone more off in the kind of Neil Adams direction of, of you know, um, expressive physical um, anatomy. But um, what he captured, he's also one of the only people who's ever drawn her at the right age. You know, um, I think he and Danny Shinyaluo and maybe Josh are the only people that ever drew X-23 as a teenage girl. Mm. And then everybody else draws her like a supermodel. And right. it's, it's wrong for the character. I mean, it's, it's wrong in a lot of ways, but, you know, it's, I like that he captures, I, the page that I kept from Mike Choi in my gallery too is her in full on rage. And you're like, I've seen angry teenagers. Like this, this is, this is clearly what angry teenagers with mutant abilities would look like. And you want to get out of their way. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to jump ahead to uh, that Al Albuquerque piece actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You look at that, just the that's the top left, and just how everything works out. He's really beautifully set his panels up, and it's just such a different look than you know, especially that the close up on the eye and the blood going into the eye is just really different than anything else you see. And I love his blue beetle, um, mm -hmm. but you know, this was really, I think, the apex of what we've seen from him, aside from what he was publishing on his own in Brazil, which is some pretty interesting stuff too. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but but yeah, you definitely need to see this in uh, your gallery to to really appreciate it because I, I thought it was a beautiful piece too, and I, and I wasn't as familiar with it. And I also zoomed in on the blood going in the eye, and I thought, you know, that's probably not the image I wanted to show really close up. On here, but, <laughs> but it's but it's, a, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. The mise en scene, you know, it's like, it's, it's really, it's a very cinematic way of doing things. And, you know, I think that people thought that people were getting really into comic book films because they're sort of already instantly a uh, storyboard. But I think at a certain point, and it's probably with the Ultimates, that um, comics became very cinematic. And I think that Watchmen was really the last statement on comics pre-cinema that um, what they were doing was what couldn't be done with a camera at that time. And now I think there's a lot of understanding of what a well cut scene is. It's like a real um, appreciation for editing that's put into single panels. And that's kind of like, if you, if you collect a lot of anime, you want those key setups within a certain scene because that's what, that's what gives you what you get on this one page. Right. I love that one. And, and uh, you had mentioned Quietly earlier, too, so I, we might as well go over to that one now. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I owned a couple of, of pages from that issue, and, and there was that great one with Damien crashing through the, um, the glass above the, um, the guys in the masks. And I knew I was going to keep one, and I just love the simplicity of this. And I love seeing his blue line under his pencils. Oh, I agree. I mean, that was always the biggest complaint when uh, – when he started doing like the new X-Men work with, with Morrison was, you know, that they really didn't like, they had a hard, hard, hard time. Thinking. Yeah. They yeah. didn't like Tim's thinking and they, they didn't like a lot of people's thinking it, it, you know, really, I mean, Scott Hanna did okay. I think on the, on the first issue or maybe it was the second issue, but, but that's why they ended up just sticking to all pencils because that was what really brought out, you know, the, the work, you know, that was unique to Frank really. And, uh, and uh, I, I love seeing his work with the blue line pencil too. I mean, I, yeah, I'd re yeah. much rather have a pencil piece than an ink piece of Frank's work. I have both and yeah, I definitely prefer this. No, that's that's a good one. And you have that uh, X-Men uh, title page or what maybe it was, a, you know, it's from it's like- the one final shot of the issue. 
Oh, is it, it's oh, is the, it the, the final? reveal. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It's the reveal at the end from 114, right? Yeah. I used to own the cover to 114, sadly. That's a beautiful piece. It was. Uh, I had pictures of it when it used to be on my wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was that was one of the mini golf uh, uh, remorse sales that I did. But but yeah, that was that was honestly probably my favorite piece, and uh, yeah, one of my biggest regrets was having to let that one go. But, yeah. But we, see, we have, we do have the same appreciation for some of these guys. Uh, let's see. This is a, this is just a prelim, but I really really liked it. Yeah, Sean. I love his preliminary work. I prefer it to the published page because it's process. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that is an important motivator in what I collect is I, I want to have a little bit of everything that shows the, what the process used to be in comics. And whether it's, you know, old pages that still have the lettering on it or, um, you know, like preliminaries or... You know, like with Ray Zone stuff, it's it's very analog because his his method wasn't a pen; it was a scalpel. So you see his fine cutting, you know, on these on these layered sheets, and then there's reworked stuff where there's things that have been drawn on top of it. And in several cases, you know, I would I'd, I was told when I when Ray was still around and his office was right around the corner from Alusta Jesus that you know, when Dave Stevens was alive, he would sometimes just stop by and sit down and do some of the retouching on some of the pages. And you know, sometimes Bernie Wrightson would do retouching on the Bernie Wrightson stuff. So it's, it's like, I love to see this because it's, it's the original idea. And this is close to the page that was published, but it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like Sean Gordon Murphy's work as well. And I mean, we just did a, the gallery opening that Comic Connect had for the for him last this month. This was from so, that. Yeah. I um, yeah, I that's what I, I, I thought I had a feeling it was. I didn't I didn't know for sure, but I thought I remembered seeing this piece. So fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I think that uh I hope I hope to host a few more of those or at least kick them off with Comic Connect. I mean they they're uh they talked about trying to have a couple more shows throughout the year. I don't know who they, yeah. they intend to get, but you know, we need more opportunities like that. You know, to, just to pick up to pick up artwork than uh, just buying them online. I, I love gallery shows, you know, and, yeah. I, and that was. I, I know a guy that might be able to help you out with that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Well, I'm here to help. I want I want to work with everybody. You know, at the end of yeah. the day. I mean, it's it's I'm, fun. I'm adding more and, comic people in. You know, like yeah. I've, I've known Dave Mack for a really really long time, and I've exhibited his work before, but he mm -hmm. was sort of tethered to a different gallery. And I, I want to do a show with him again. Um, man, that that variant cover for Daredevil, the yeah. Electra cover, is like the best thing I've seen in comics in decades. Like I, I called him up. I was like, man, you know, I, I never talked to you really about your comic art because we we talk about other stuff. But I was mm -hmm. like, that's that thing is amazing. Like that's like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Thanks. You know, he doesn't expect it because. The fine art gallery but i'm like that stuff is incredible that stands the test right. of time no it does yeah i love david's work and he's uh he's such a positive guy you know a lot of a lot of a lot of good energy he does he does a lot of good things in the name of our country so mm -hmm. uh yeah no he's he's phenomenal and that, and that would be a great show to have if you could ever do that i mean I, yeah i completely agree ah the dark side reveal Final Crisis. Yeah. J.G. Jones. Yep. He, I, 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 I pinged him about this not too long ago. And he's like, that page nearly killed me. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, a little, to, it's a little, it's a little unexpected, you know, in, in a way. I mean, when I look at that, I didn't think J.G. Jones at first when I was going through your gallery. And then I was like, wow, you know, that really is. I mean, because, I, I, you know, I, have, I just have a different feel for his inking. Then I see this yeah. piece, and yeah, it blew me away. It's better than the cover of that issue. Yeah. Now, did you buy this directly from him, or or how did you get it? Who did I get that from? Um, that might have been from Cool Lines. Yeah, I think so. I think that was from Cool Lines. You're the first person on my show that said they bought something from Cool Lines. 
<laughs> I've learned a lot of stuff from him, actually. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm actually kidding. I, I, am, <laughs> I, I know it's fashionable. I, th- I, think, you're, even. I, I think you're the, the first person to, to admit that, though. But, you know, it's like, I, I know, and I'm great friends with those guys. I mean, I built their website. We I talk yeah. to them several times a year. Uh, they do get a bad rep, unfortunately. But uh, I have a beautiful Sid Mead piece from him. Oh, really? Yeah, I repped three or four Sid Mead pieces for him that he couldn't list. Uh-huh. And... Um, there was no buyers for them. And I was shocked. Mm-hmm. They were great pieces. And then as I was about to give them back, I'm like, I think I need to keep this one and, <laughs> and just bought it outright. It's this amazing, you know, general motors painting. Like it looks like there's a stack of magic mushrooms on the table. And there's like a car that looks like the 1982 Pantera that was designed in 1972. And it's, mm-hmm. it's just everything you want from Sid Mead that isn't if, if not film production stuff. Right. So, right. Um, oh no. And, I, yeah. And he lived right up the street. Well, I mean, they're they're just not the right venue to sell that. I know that they're very they're very into that kind of artwork as well, and I, I know they have some similar uh, work on their site. But I, I always I never see it see them moving it. I mean, I guess that's in general yeah. the, the normal thing. But just that's just not something you would think a comic art dealer would have. But uh, but no, Sid Mead's work is you know there's not enough of his work. On calf, that's for sure. I'll upload it. I'll upload it. You should. You, you really yeah. should because I, I, I really love, uh, you know, I have a, I love illustration work. You know, I, that's why I work with the, the people who do, you know, Magic the Gathering stuff through that other book. And uh, I love it just as much as comic book artwork. And so I, I, I love old advertising artwork, especially from that era. Uh, yeah, give me give me a, a drawing of an old muscle car. You know that was used in a in in a in a old comic book or or wherever it would have been a trade publication and I and I'm all over it so uh, that's yeah. that's my sweet spot for sure. But so as we talked about before, I didn't get to own that Lamborghini on that poster on my wall. Right. But I did get to own a Sydney drawing of a <laughs> Lamborghini. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's it. I would take that priority. Would, exactly. <laughs> All right, so it's a Stegman piece. Yeah, it's a it's a commission too, and I usually don't, I usually don't buy commissions, and I usually don't buy sketches. But um, this popped up on eBay, and I remembered seeing this on his webs, like on his Instagram when he was doing it. And I mean, I love that issue of Daredevil that it's a tribute to, and you know, it's also oddly a tribute to Frank Miller's. Wolverine number one, mm-hmm. and I contacted the um, the guy who was selling it had a, a pretty reasonable price on it, but um, I shot him an email and I was like, "How old is this?" You know, and just to kind of make sure that it was the real deal because I'd never bought from him before, and uh, it all matched up. And so, um, and he and then he offered me a discount, like straight up offered me a discount, and so I, I jumped on it. I paid him immediately. When I got it back, I um, you know, I sent a, a message to um, to uh, Stegman, and um, and he's like, "Oh man, I should use that as a as a um a variant cover." And I was like, "I, I really hope you do," <laughs> 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 for many reasons. But um, it kind of opened me up to a whole different type of collecting, and I had never really thought about commissions, you know, for um, alt covers. And it's become a thing that I do now. Um, I've got a, a Bennett commission that I'll probably be getting back from him in a month um, that I would also not be surprised if he ends up using it as um, a variant for his Hulk run. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've reached out to a couple of other people that where I, I missed pieces that, um, that I really, really wanted. Uh, in one case, I, I have a tattoo actually of um, a Chris Pacello death piece it was his first drawing of death it's the seven faces of death it was in a dc releases and it was being held for me at his his booth in at comic-con and someone else um saw it there and he had stepped away and his wife was was manning the booth and the guy said that he was me and paid cash oh no yeah and um i caused kind of a scene like in the middle of comic-con that year and security escorted him out the door. With the art? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, I, I couldn't. I offered him twice what he had just paid. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, Chris was, was, he's like, Oh, I'm really sorry. You know, I just didn't know what to do. You know, it's right. it the transaction. It was closed and it was unfortunate. The guy did a shitty thing, but, um, and I did, you know, <laughs> full clarity threatened to kill him right there and then. But, um, but the, you know, I think he thought that they were going to escort me out. Right. Well, that's what I was gonna say. Kind of waiting around and they, they kind of heard the story and they're like, yeah, we'll walk you out the door, you know, but <laughs> that's the only safety we can offer you, you know, it's like, we'll make sure he stays here for 15 minutes. Like <laughs> run to your car, dude, because everybody's not on your side. Um, right. And then I'd already had it tattooed. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's only right that eventually I own it. So I, I actually, I've, I've recently reached out to Chris to ask him if he would do another version of it for me. I haven't heard back. I hope he says yes. I'm sure he remembers that moment though. Boss, I, I would imagine it's a long time ago, but I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's rotten. But you know, that's yeah. I hear so many. That, that's one of the worst stories I've ever heard. But you know, there's so many stories like that where a collector pops in and they, you know, they they take the opportunity to uh, pry something out that isn't theirs. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's sad. Yep. But I'm glad you stood your ground, though, and you proved your yeah. point too. <laughs> To the security guards, because yeah, the moment you said you were going to kill him, I figured you were the guy that they were going to throw out. Yeah, I, 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 when they came up, I was sort of thinking that that it is a naked city shirt, yes. Um, and the, um, I was thinking that I was going to get get the bums rush, but I was I was surprised. I do still have the tattoo. Yes, I actually have several uh, death tattoos. Um, I've got a Vince Lock uh, commission that I do on the work for. Uh, I also have uh, the key to hell. Um, from the cover of Seasons of Mist. Um, I think I my death tattoo was the first death tattoo that Neil Gaiman had ever seen. Um, I also have a Tank Girl tattoo, which is probably the first Tank Girl tattoo that anybody ever got. It was very, it was before it was being published in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another commission that I would I would like is to get Jamie to, to draw the particular piece that I have. But... I don't know. I don't think he gets out of bed for less than ten thousand dollars. So, <laughs> probably not. Not anymore. Uh, let, uh, let's look at you know. I wanted to pull up this uh, Chris Weston piece next because yes. I, I mentioned yeah. to you earlier. Uh, Chris, I'm a huge fan of Chris's work, and I mean, he can do no wrong. Everything he posts on Facebook, I, you know, I, I absolutely love. But I wish he was doing more, you know, more work in comics because I, you know, I just loved everything he touched. And yeah. uh, and his uh, his work with Morrison was just fantastic. And this is from the filth. Um, yep. issue three. There's two I versions think. of the page, and um, this I think the that um, there's a super imposition of the monkey character in one version of this. I think in the version that got published, and I'd seen this and um, and purchased this instead. This was supposed to go into the pop sequentialism show, but I refused to put it in because I refused to sell it. And um, instead I put in the title page. But um, yeah, I love Weston's work for sure. Hold that up for a second because I'm gonna go grab a quick drink of water. Not a problem. <laughs> Dino, very, very good point. Lesson to buy the art before getting a tattoo. What are you gonna do? You know, you never know, but uh, Thanks for the uh, email earlier too, Dino. I'm uh, definitely looking forward to that, and I will keep you updated uh, as to my uh, my mission with with uh, Mr. Berkey to get some of those uh, that art scanned. So hopefully that I can get that done uh, sometime soon. I'm supposed to go over there Sunday, but I don't know if I'll be able to do any scanning. We were going to shoot some more memes for uh, Wednesday's show, so um, we'll see. I've got. Uh, I have to take the green screen over there and uh, and do another uh, Spider-Man swinging since we've got uh, we've got the whole gimmick I think worked out really good this time. For those who saw last night's episode, it was, that was a highlight. But uh, let's see. How do we? Yes. Uh, what was the winning guess, Carlos? You know, uh, he, they're going to actually announce it tomorrow. Because they, you know, I, I probably shouldn't have done it when I announced, uh, you know, the contest on the Tuesday show, and then we did the thing last night. He got way too many guesses in the last uh, day, 
and they couldn't get through all of them because they they were silly enough to actually say you can post on instagram to or wherever else so not only did they have to go through all their emails then they had to check every social site and so they're going through and compiling it this evening to figure out uh, who, who actually won because they couldn't get it done before we start. We did the 8, 8 uh, p.m. Pre premiere of the show for him. So live and learn. I think he'll he'll figure he'll cut the uh, voting off or the submission period off at least 24 hours before we're going to debut anything ever again. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you never know. You never you never know what to expect from those kinds of things. So but uh, welcome back, Matt. Uh, Thank that's you. why I, I keep bottles. I, I have three bottles of water strategically placed in front of me because I've, I've done these often enough to know that I'm going to run out or I'm going to knock one over and need another one. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I love Chris Weston's work and uh, it's like, you just, there, there just isn't a lot of his published work out there. And I, I had the chance to pick up an invisibles page a month ago and I should have bought it. Even it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a, my, one of my favorites, but I, you know, I look at it and it's just, it's like my thoughts today in buying art. It's like when you see it, you just probably should buy it because you'll, you know, not that you might regret that page, but just the opportunity to pick up a published piece by Chris mm -hmm. is so rare that I should have just bought it just to have it because it might be the only one I see for the next 12 months. So his 2000 AD stuff too is fantastic. Yeah. And the, um, I mean, that's another area of collecting that I think is really underregarded, which is, all of the 2000 AD stuff, look at all the talent that came out of that magazine. I mean, not even counting the writers, you know, not even counting, you know, people like John Wagner and Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and Neil Gaiman and, um, you know, Brennan, Brandon and, and Pete, like all, basically the entire British invasion came straight out of the page of 2000 AD. But even the era afterwards, and you think of, you know, Dave Gibbons doing uh, Rogue Troop or Alan Davis doing DR and Quinch, there's like Bisley, you know, there's like, it just, the hits kept coming. Like mm -hmm. the talent was just constantly, constantly good. And some of my favorite Judge Dredd stuff isn't even necessarily the, um, the Brian Boland stuff, but that stuff that I first saw in newsprint, you know, in the, um, the, the import section of Newbury Comics, you know, over oh, yeah, sure. growing up in Boston. Yeah. And it was selling to punk rock kids. It wasn't selling to comic book fans. Mm -hmm. And that stuff, you know, I think it was, um, is it Carlos Escovera who was doing uh, the longest run, I think, on on Judge Dredd? That stuff's right. incredible. Like, I would I would love to get a, a Judge Anderson, Judge Death piece, of course, you know, Brian Boland. But um, just a nice panel page from, from 2000 AD from that era would be fantastic. And a lot of that stuff isn't as expensive as you'd think it should be probably. That's true. Yeah. Anybody who has Amazon prime, there is, well, at least last month there was, there was a fantastic 2000 AD documentary that I would highly recommend. It was, you know, really, really enjoyable. I, I watched it twice. I enjoyed it so much. So, I mean, my friend guys Severn produced that. Yes. Oh, really? Really? Oh, yeah. It was great. I mean, I I was enthralled. I, I love, you know, they, they really were able to interview almost everybody that I would have wanted to hear from. And yeah, and yeah no, I, I highly recommend it if it's still on Amazon Prime that everybody should check that out. Yeah. And uh, Ruben asked about Chris having a rep. Uh, he used to be repped by Flash Page, but uh, yeah. I, I know he left gosh, probably 10, 11 years ago. And I think he's just, uh, his soul, he sold his stuff, anything that he sold, he sells on his own now. So yeah. as far as I, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but uh, I don't think he's wrapped by anybody. The last thing I saw of his for sale were pages from the book of Eli. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Other than that, he has like one off types of things that he'll, he puts out on Facebook and, uh, and he's done a few uh, auctions through eBay, EB, yeah. you know, UK, the UK. So, so it's funny because they don't really, they, I don't think he lists them. So they get listed in the U S too. So periodically when I see it, I'll kind of share it over on our Facebook page too. So people know that it's even out there, but, um, yeah. but yeah, that's about the only thing I've seen from him in the last couple of years. I sold a, a commission that I had him do for, um, I had him do it for somebody that I had in mind and then the person passed away. So I was never able to give it to them. But, um, so I had it on, um, I had it on, on calf for quite a while. And I think it sold not during this last comic art live, but during the first one. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think that's it was, but it was a color commission. It was pretty great. Right, that's the ones that he's been selling. You know that he does sell, and it's usually like every other month. It seems like every so every sixty days he has a new piece, and and they're 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 color and they're absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And uh, Knights of Bold, you were asking uh, how do we e email you or where do you email? Are you talking about? Uh, so you're talking about Matt, right? How how can you get in touch with him? Yeah, yeah. Um, if he wants to shoot an email to me at info at gallery thirty south, and it's gallery three zero s o u t h dot com. Um, there's also info at popsequentialism dot com, um, which either will will come directly to me. Um, and yeah, so that's that's probably the the two best places. Um, I'm also at, I think this probably, yeah, I see the links there on the, uh, on the page, I think. So, um, yeah, anything pop sequentialism or gallery 30 South will, will lead back to me. So, right. um, yeah. I'll be sure after this is over to, to actually put all the links in there that are proper and link over to your calf gallery and everything too. So people can check out your, your collection you've got and you do have art for a lot of art for sale in your calf gallery. Yeah. actually, so. Including the uh, Chris Weston piece actually. Oh, I didn't know that. See, I, 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 didn't, I didn't look at the art for sale. I only looked at the things that yeah. were for sale. All it's right, a weird right. page because it's like like one of the best panels, but it's just one panel on a otherwise empty page because he, he does that piecemeal thing where he'll glue stuff together. Mm -hmm. Just like, um, like there's a lot of stuff like that in Fables pages too. You know, I won't be able to find it. I wish, because I actually don't, I've only got some pieces of Chris's. No, nah, you know, I'm not even going to dig for them. I'll, have to, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take pictures of them and send them to you because I've got just some, some of the loose sketches that he's done, and they're just amazing. Yeah. So much detail, and, uh, you know, that just blows my mind, but I don't have a published piece by him. So I've got, and I've he got can do that while he's chatting with you, too, which is crazy. I know. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's. I, I'd love to see him do work in comics again, though. I mean, if he yep. ever work, because he he trained uh, under uh, Lawrence, right? Don Lawrence, I think, is he was like his mentor. Uh, oh, the the a Marvel Man guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yep. he's a uh, he's got a great pedigree. At the end of the day, yep. I mean. Speaking of which, I'd love to see Gary Leach do more comic artwork. That's yeah, without question. Yeah, no, that would be that would be great. Let's see here. Uh, uh, there we go. All right. The uh, Jill Thompson piece. Yep. Just picked that up very recently. Uh, speaking of manga, right? Uh, um, yeah. I just, I love this series. I might even like it better than Seasons of Mist. And um, it's sort of her take on that. So it's, it's she wrote and illustrated this. It's not written by Neil Gaiman, um, but definitely is sort of a different take of that same material. I, I kind of liken it to how, um, what's a good example of that? The, uh, the movie, The Night Comers with Marlon Brando is sort of yeah. like uh, um, a different angle take on Turn of the Screw. Wow. No, this, is, this is really nice. And I do see, I didn't realize that you just added this to your cap gallery. That's beautiful. Yeah really recent i just i love her work um you know she, she'll always be i think most uh, associated with the character delirium mm -hmm. but um i remember her first comic con after she worked on sandman she made these little stuffed dolls of death and dream that she kind of hand sewed and she would sell them at the cons yeah and I, th I i don't think they were sold yet and i don't know why the hell i didn't buy them like it's it's sort of that other thing that fits everything that I'm all about. Like I love craft mm -hmm. and um, you know, like in our apartment, my wife and I, I have like my little kind of office room, which has a lot of animation and, and not, not a lot of comic art stuff actually on the walls, but comic adjacent stuff. Like I've got um, some, um, I've got some Rodol uh, uh, Jose Rodolfo Luisa Ontiveros paintings. He's a kind of Disney remix guy. Mm -hmm. very authentic to um to the actual house look but he, his work is very about um encompassing stuff that disney wouldn't put and not not in a kind of uh harsh like wally wood you know mickey mouse orgy way but really more in a, um how can we be more inclusive kind of way and I, i've exhibited his work annually for like a decade but 
Um, I've also got some Mark Todd pieces where Mark Todd does his Jack Kirby um, sort of um, disassembled. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very Kirby-esque, but there's a kind of weird fine art element to it. And when I first saw it, I really hated it. I was like, that's ripping off Jack Kirby. This is like a complete ripoff. And then I sort of understood what he was doing and that it really was more of a tribute and that it really does position like when you take one thing out of this iconic image, you really appreciate what was there before. Mm -hmm. And the way that he's been able to do it is, is quite interesting to me. And I've, I've been a deep collector of Mark Todd's work as well. And Mark Todd teaches at Art Center and has had some really, really talented people pass through his classroom. He's also, of course, married to um, Esther Pearl Watson, who is working on a show now for um, uh, of her, one of her zines. I think it's the, um, they, they found like a notebook in a gas station in Las Vegas. And so she just started doing a zine of the entries in this like lost weird diary journal thing. Um, and I think it's being produced for uh, Matt Graney. Oh, cool. Yeah. Michael Lark. Yep. Final issue of the um, Ed. Um, Ed, Ed Brubaker. Daredevil. Yeah, yeah. Ed Brubaker's on and Daredevil. And it's got, you know, three things that are signature to that series. So, you know, Stick is back and it's the, the battle between Kingpin and, and Murdoch. And I also on the very last page of that run, which is where Matt Murdoch becomes the leader of the hand. I think that's listed in my, my sales gallery. Still haven't really made up my mind if I really want to sell it or not. Yeah, no, I, I love Michael's work. Yeah, you know, he, uh, it's so dark, but you know, he, he's, he's just got a flair for action. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't capture and uh, no, he's, he's always been a favorite of mine. And again, you know, with Mark rep, repping him, I've gotten to hang out with him a lot and I've gotten to see a lot of, a lot of his artwork over the years. So yeah, yeah he's, well, you he's, get to see that great difference, you know, between his pencils and the inked page. Like that's again, that really important part of process to me where you get to see everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always include the two together. I think some people split them up and that's just wrong to me. Like, I'm also like that kind of guy that I don't want to split up a cell from the Doga, you know, right. like when I'm selling animation stuff, I think that they belong together, you know, and, and you might not display them together, but I, I feel like, you know, with one should come the other. Right. Right. No, I agree. I agree. I, I always like, uh, you know, Paul Rivera and his dad, Joe Rivera, you know, Paul's doing the pencils and his dad ends up inking blue lines and you buy, and you get the pieces together. Uh, yeah. There's just something really unique about that kind of dynamic. So, yeah, Mark's been, I think, very fortunate in some of the people that he's repped. You know, they've always had a very unique approach to their to their work. And, yeah, uh, yeah uh, great time hanging out with those guys. He's just uh, such a decent dude, you know, like, and I, I know there's been occasions where I think that some artists have, you know, sort of left for what they might think is a better deal. And I don't think they're playing on the long game. Like you don't stay hot forever. And it's, you know, if you've got somebody who's been loyal for a really long time and, and can sell your work, then you should continue to let that happen. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Mark, Mark, uh, it, it, it pains him every time yeah. you know, something like that happens. I mean, cause he takes, you know, it's, it's just like anything else. You really put a lot of effort and you, and, you, and, and, and he's a friendship guy at the end of the yep. day, you know, he's, he really creates a bond with the people he works with or the, or the people he knows. And uh, that's, that's what I love about him. He can, yep. he can, he, he can whine a little bit to me and, and it never makes me mad because he's always, <laughs> uh, cause I know, I know he's a, he's a true blue friend. Yeah. But uh so I got two more pieces to look at. One, one yeah. I, fe I featured in a calf update a few weeks ago, actually, this Bernie Wrightson. I love this. Yeah. I got I really, think, really lucky with that. It just, um, the stars lined up. Uh, I think I got that from Anthony. Oh, and wow. I think I got it from Anthony the week that Bernie died. Like, I think I, I, I was sort of nervous that I hadn't gotten it yet when I got the news that Bernie had died and I was wondering if I was, if it was actually going to get sent. Um, and luckily it did. And tragically, you know, it was a worry because he had passed away. 
Um, but that's a, a chapter card for Frankenstein. And it wasn't very expensive. I mean, it was really, really not very expensive. And I never thought that I would ever have a chance of owning, um, you know, a really good Wrightson again. I did own a really great Bernie Wrightson piece um, when I was a teenager in Boston. It was in a convention box that got stolen. And it was um, a, his version of the movie poster for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've never come across it again. And um, so, and I'm sure that if I do, the person who has it isn't the person who stole it. Um, mm -hmm. At this point, of course, any statute of limitations is long past. But um, it, definitely a fantastic example of everything you want from a Bernie Wrightson piece. Uh, yeah, without question. And, uh, you know, I've been looking for a rights and peace now, too. I feel like I've got to have one for my collection. So I, I am on the lookout. Uh, and hopefully I've got my eye on something. I have to see if I can swing a deal for it. But, yeah. but yeah, it's it. That's that's what I've decided. I, I've, I'm just going to focus on a couple of different people that I really want to get something from. And rights and rights would be it, especially, the, you know, the market's so hot for, for his work right now. It's really difficult, yeah. unfortunately. He holds so, the record now, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. But profiles in history is no more, you know, now that, uh, that now that Joe's moved on to heritage and everything, too. So that's a that's an interesting turn of events for our, for our hobby and for the for the future. That's for sure. It's like all, all the good guys end up going to heritage at the end of the day. You know, it's like every, every uh, I've had other advertising clients of CAF, you know, get get hired away to heritage. So it's always a challenge for me when, when, when those things happen. But, you know, what are you, you yeah. going to do? Right. Yeah. All right, so so one last piece. This is uh, from Miss Marvel fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Again, it was. Um, I, I think I reached out directly to the artist. Um, he lives in Japan. His rep speaks English, and I was sort of expecting that perhaps he wouldn't. And if I got a, a message back, I'd have my wife draft um, an email back to him. Um, and. Frequently now, most most people that are, are Japanese artists working in American comics do speak English. Peach Momoko speaks fantastic English. Um, and I just saw this piece and couldn't believe it was still available. Um, you know, a, a full page action splash. Um, Ms. Marvel is super hot. Um, you know, you don't see any Ms. Marvel art on the market. It just goes. It's kind of like, um, you know, Spider Gwen. Mm -hmm. uh, very rarely do you see any Spider-Gwen pages available. And this has, again, like all the earmarks of that particular character. She's using her power. So you've got the exaggeratedly large fist and, um, you know, she's using the strength. And it's just, you know, very much who she is. So if you were going to capture a character in anything that wasn't a cover, I felt like this was probably the best thing. And he's probably, if not the primary artist, and I, I don't think you could say that he's the primary artist, but he's probably the second most associated artist with the character. So, um, you know, that, that was important to me too. And, and again, it was also important that it be part of a run that G. Willow Wilson had written. So, you know, that, that element of collaboration of it being a perfect match of, of artist and writer together is, you know, what really informs most of what I collect. Right. Right. And I like the fact that you do put some writers in with your, you know, it's the artist description and artist details. Yeah. I'm not, not a lot of people do that, but I, I, I saw that right away on this piece. And uh, Willow Wilson definitely, you know, I mean, I understand why you want this piece. And, and I, I love uh, uh, the work done on, uh, on Spider-Gwen by Takeshi. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's actually a few pieces on Cap. I think there's almost a hundred hundred artworks by them. So I was a little surprised because I checked that before the show. Um, I thought it would have been a little bit more, you know, obscure and not have even eighteen or twenty pieces on the site. So I was kind of yeah. pleasantly surprised. Splashes, but, though, those splashes are, are pretty rare. Covers are super rare. I mean, I think these days people aren't going to put them up. I, if they're collecting them, it's great. They should absolutely share, and that's fantastic. The um and when it comes for for sales, the um it seems like that stuff always goes to auction. Mm -hmm. So who is the rep? I mean, do they have a have a website that you're able to go to to browse all that? Because I'm not familiar 
Yeah, okay. I, I see someone in the in the comments is saying that he's Canadian and he speaks perfect English. Um, I was working through a rep, and the rep that I spoke to spoke Japanese uh, and spoke English with a Japanese accent. So perhaps you know, um, Takeshi just doesn't want to handle any of his sales, but he does have a rep that works for him. Well, Tim, that Tim rep is also Tim. Japanese and does have an accent. There you go. Well, Tim, Tim is in Japan. Pan, if I'm not mistaken, right, Tim, or or am I just not following your Facebook feed very well? <laughs> but uh, no, that's uh, but yeah, that's that's great. So yeah, you'll have to email me the reps information because I'm always, I I always like to keep a list. So sure, yeah, that, I do not know that one, but um, but we've hit the two hour mark. Well, I've hit the two hour mark. I guess I should say yes, Tim. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And Tim is in Japan. So see, Tim, I do pay attention. I do pay attention. Uh, but um, one day if I ever go to, to Japan, Tim, I will definitely look you up as long as you're still there. Uh, but Matt, it's been, you know, it's been fantastic. But yeah, two hours is, I, I think our, that's the attention span that of most of the <laughs> my YouTube yeah. visitors. So I, I sincerely appreciate the fact that you took all this time tonight to, to hang oh, out. Oh, my and, pleasure. Uh, if there is ever anything that I can do for you, you know, just let me know. And if you ever really want to do any any kind of opening that you feel like would benefit from from us, you know, sharing the video, you know, sharing the opening online, because mm -hmm. I, I really did have a lot of fun with the with doing the Sean Gordon Murphy thing. I mean, I was behind the scenes for most of it and mm -hmm. just pulling it art up for them, but uh, but I, I really kind of ran the whole show, and uh, I'd I'd love to do that if you ever ever needed any help. I I would completely enjoy doing it. I want to I want to do more of that with this channel than just, you know, always doing the, you know, the chats and everything. I want to do more things that are just kind of outside of just con con conversation. And if we can help, uh, you know, sell artwork or get, get new artwork in front of people that uh, they might not be aware of, I, I want to be a part of that. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, right off the top of my head, I think of like, you know, Danny Shinyalua, who I rep and has certainly done, you know, she's done comic covers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope she gets back into doing some more comic centric stuff. Um, and we've got, you know, which you were very kind to send out, you know, information about the Daniel uh, Johnson show that we have up now, which is his right. more comic centric artwork, but not artwork from his own comic. But um, there's also a guy named Bale that we're going to be showing again in May, who's a, um, a British artist who I think is a really good match for um, for Comic-Con. I'm trying to introduce him to some people. Um, he's sort of like a cross between Aegon Shela and Patrick Nagel. Which is oh, sounds very different, but when you see it, you'll think those two things. Right. No. Well, Aegon Cielo was was one of my favorite you know illustrators when I was going to college, and mm -hmm. uh, and Patrick Nagel. I mean, who didn't like Patrick Nagel in the in, you know in the seventies and eighties? So I can't even yep. imagine what that artwork looks like. But I would love to see it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, awesome. Well, hey, thanks for hosting me. Thanks for having me on the show. No, it's my pleasure, and uh, thanks for everybody for tuning in. I, I, you know, I sincerely appreciate it. We'll be back on the air Tuesday evening with uh, Felix and uh, Jason talking about uh, digital art sales. So I hope everybody tunes in for that. Well, it'll, it's going to be educational for me as well. As much as I think I know about it, those guys know much more than I do, and it'll be good just to kind of get it out there and, and have everybody talk about it. So again, Matt. Lots of fun. Thank you so much. And, uh, and you know, anything I can do for you, just let me know. I am here for you. Awesome. Thanks, right. Bill. Good, 